And welcome, and thank you, thank you for coming. So um, this is going to be a different kind of meeting, so I'm not standing up at the podium to start. And uh, if, for those of you who, like I am, are old enough to remember Phil Donahue, you'll get a certain sense, especially if you haven't been to an ICER meeting. There's going to be a lot of interaction, because the reason we've had this meeting is not to bring people who know so much about this topic as you do and try to teach you something new, is to try to encourage an engagement among you and to help share ideas and perspectives um, with, a, with a, you know, a very specific, if you will, purpose, even though it, it will sound vague. The, the, the purpose is to try to make some progress in an area that every single country in the world wrestles with. We're all familiar with the tensions around affordability, around innovation, around access. There's nothing completely new about that. It's certainly been in the news a lot in the pharmaceutical space over the past few years. But you take every single element of those tensions that can arise, and you start to talk about rarer and rarer conditions. And it's just like if we were at Spinal Tap, we're turning it up to 11. It's just everything seems to get more challenging, more difficult. And every time we think science can solve it, we find that, no, it's really a social discussion or a social dialogue that we need to have. And again, as many of you live near Washington, you know we're so good at having social dialogues. We're so good at that kind of coming together. But that's what we're really here to try to do today. Because we have to figure out a way forward and it's not going to be easy. There's no magic bullet. So again, you're not going to come home with the one solution to, to the kind of questions that we have. But I hope that we'll all have a chance to share, again, the perspectives, the experience, um, the real world lived experience of patients, of families, the experience of payers working with their clients and trying to figure out how to cover and to provide these, these medicines for clinicians, for caring for patients and of innovators who struggle in the space to try to figure out how to raise the funds, how to keep the pipelines going, and how to make real progress for patients and for society. So that's, that's what we're here to try to do. I'd like to thank the Kaiser Permanente Total, uh, help, sorry, Center for Total Health for hosting us here today. For those of you who haven't been here before, it's really a, a wonderful space. And I encourage you to, to take a, a stroll on the back corridors here because you'll see some great uh, examples of the ways that health can be considered from a very holistic and broad perspective um, and, in ways that I think are, are quite helpful to see. Just from a housekeeping perspective, the bathrooms are through a little corridor on the back here. You'll see the signs and then you go through this glass door and you turn left and just keep following the signs and you'll find the, the, the restrooms there. So I have a lot more thanks as we go through, but Initially, again, thanks to the people who've traveled a long way to be here. Um, and I'd also like to thank, I think I have this as the first slide. Actually, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to point this. <laughs> what would Phil Donahue do? There we go. Maybe someone did that for me. Thanks. So first, an, an overview of the day. So we're going to spend about a half hour doing uh, goal setting. And then there's going to be an overview of the briefing paper that I know most of you have received and have probably looked at um, prior to coming up. So uh, Dr. Dan Ohlendorf and Rick Chapman from ICER will uh, be giving a brief overview of that. And then we're going to break the rest of the day into four issues. And there will be panelists who are going to come up. But again, it's going to be a very different kind of meeting because none of them has a presentation to give you. There won't be slides. We're going to grapple with very specific issues around, first with contextual considerations and the ethical issues that in some way kind of frame the entire discussion of the day. Then we're going to have a discussion specifically on the evidence, generation, and assessment related to judgments about comparative clinical effectiveness of drugs for rare and ultra-rare conditions. We're going to talk about other benefits or disadvantages. Now, some of the terminology here uh, is explicitly um, selfish. <laughs> it's related to ICER's view of a value framework in which we have clinical effectiveness. We have incremental long-term cost effectiveness. We have these other benefits or disadvantages, which we consider to be 
elements that you want to think about when you're making judgments of value, but that might fall outside of the information that you gain through clinical trials and through a model of incremental cost effectiveness. So we want to talk about those specifically in the context of, of or orphan and ultra-orphan uh, drugs. Issue four will be price, cost effectiveness, and affordability. We figured we would leave, uh, in some sense, the juiciest topic in some people's minds towards the end, because setting it up and making sure that we get the building blocks is, is really important. And the very last session will be an open, again, an open discussion among us all about, um, if not specific solutions, are there any guiding principles for the assessment of the value of, of orphan drugs. It's going to be very hard. We're not, again, hoping to come away with any kind of formal consensus, but we'd really like to get your thoughts to help steer groups like ICER and many others. All of you in, are in some way are involved in some judgments about value. So how should we try to work together in that sense and what would be some of the guiding principles? So with that, I, I did have a thank to the Next slide. Oh, is it not on? Are you kidding me? Just all I had to do was turn it on? Okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, ICER's team, uh, led by Sarah Emond, our executive VP and chief operating officer, worked with a, a working group that, again, bears no responsibility for the, the actual content of the discussion today or for the briefing paper, but was very helpful in, in advising us on whom to bring into the room, how to frame some of the, the topics. Uh, obviously, everybody sees certain landmines and how to navigate around them. So I really want to thank the representatives from, from Anthem, from Cure SMA, the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases, the National Pharmaceutical Council, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, and Sarepta Therapeutics for their long-term, actually, ad advice and guidance to us as we kind of prepared for, for today's meeting. So thanks. All right, let me just start with a question after this. Who right now, before the meeting starts, let's assume that there is a way to assess the value of a drug for a common condition, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Now, I know that there's not consensus necessarily on how to do that, but let's assume that there's a way to do it. And obviously, payers every day are making judgments or making tiering decisions are having pricing negotiations around all kinds of different treatments. Let's assume there's a way to do that. How many of you think that the assessment of an orphan drug should be done distinctly differently? How many of you think that it should be done the same way, that there's no reason to make a major distinction? All right. So I would, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say three quarters, one quarter, at least at the beginning of the room, maybe of the day, maybe two thirds, one third. And we'll talk a lot about this, obviously, because this is part of the, of the goal for today, which is to think about <clears throat> this fact. And believe me, we are going to talk about what's orphan and what's ultra-orphan. Maybe we should do that first. We all know from the, from the paper you've read that, and we'll hear, hear more about it, but in the U.S., the FDA considers orphan to be anything less than a prevalence of 200,000 individuals. When you really think about it, that's a big spectrum. That could mean anything from, from 1,000 to 199,000 patients. So we all know that people will sometimes use the term ultra-orphan or ultra-rare. Does anybody have a good idea of how to make that distinction on the, on the face of it? Here I come, don't be shy. <laughs> John Watkins. Well, you, actually, each table has a, has a microphone. I'll be interested in how you guys have self-sorted your, yourselves into these tables, but please introduce yourself, by the way, in your organization, and we'll get to know each other through the course Hi, of the day. Hi, John Watkins, Primera Blue Cross. I usually think in terms of 10 to 20,000 prevalence in the U.S. So anything below 20,000-ish would be ultra-orphan. 
Yes, and you did point out in the briefing paper the issue of prevalence being driven by, partially by survival. Mm -hmm. So with the SMA type 1, for example, you would have a higher prevalence if they live longer. Uh, well, actually, we'll go back to the back table and we'll come back to Alan. Yes. I think it may be in the eye of the beholder. Sorry, could you introduce yourself, please? Adam Warner from the Alpha One Foundation. I just wonder if that definition is in the eye of the beholder. It depends on why you're using that term and what, what you're trying to accomplish. How, do you have any suggestions for, is, is, there, is it useful to create a distinction? Because I know some people will probably feel that it may not be wise to try to make some distinction. And by distinction, I guess, since we're talking about how we're going to assess their value, that would be the operative function. And we haven't say how differently we're going to do it, if at all, but. Well, I personally don't think there should be a distinction. Okay. But I have another question, and that is the definition of rare disease in general. It's an absolute number, which kind of doesn't make a lot of sense as the population uh, changes in, in number. So as, as you saw from the briefing paper, different countries have different cutoffs, and they tend, I mean, you can usually, we tried to boil it down to a per, per 100,000 population so you could see how the variation occurred. Um, and even governments, there are also private organizations, payers, and others who might have different kinds of distinctions. And they, they do change um, in terms of operational. Sometimes there's a, a, an official set level for orphan, but how health systems manage different tracks for assessment and payment for more rare conditions really can either change through time or certainly across countries in terms of what that threshold is. What was, Dan, where, or, yeah, what was the, the Japanese, I think, don't the Japanese have a, an official ultra rare versus rare cutoff? Somebody does, I, I forget. Italy? So it, five per million is ultra rare, okay. Obviously these numbers have no basis in anything other than somebody decided to draw a line because there's probably nothing magical about 1.2 for, for 5 million or whatever it is. Any, any other perspectives that people want to raise right now? Yes, Mitch. Sorry, not Mitch. <laughs> Hi, it's, it's Steve Osmond with Biocentric. I, I think you can make a distinction between diseases that um, have a mechanism that suggests that a, a drug or a therapy for that disease will uniquely be uh, useful for that condition and ones that are likely to also be useful for other conditions, for more common conditions. So, so, you, so for example, the enzyme replacement therapies for lysosomal storage diseases, there's no chance that they're going to be useful for any, there's not going to be any economic or therapeutic benefit outside those very narrow indications. So what I, what I hear you bringing in then is at least some thinking about, well, I wasn't sure if you were talking about what the return to the company would be given the, the future populations or if it was more. Well, it's both. It's both the, the return to the company, but it's also the, the cost to payers and it's the, um, the considerations for, for patients and for society as a whole. It's going to be different for um, a drug that's being developed and it's only going to be useful for a very limited population, say 10,000 or 20,000, mm -hmm. and one where you've found, you've identified a population of 10 or 20,000, and that qualifies as orphan, but, um, but, there's, but it's clear that it's also going to be useful for a condition, for example, that um, affects a million people. So this, this idea, I think, is important to, to wrestle with, is, is some distinction, perhaps even around orphan these days, but certainly around ultra-orphan, is it linked to our guess I would call it a guess sometimes about how broad a population will ultimately be used, you know, be treated with this, with this drug. Does that make a difference? And if, if so, do we have to try to figure out when and how and who makes that, that judgment? Um, can people on the innovator side, can you, can you think, is it, is it always absolutely clear cut, always exactly what the patient population is going to be for an ultra rare condition, an ultra rare treatment? I would think that there must be plenty of times when it's not that, that crystal clear. And especially with adaptive, with the whole idea of trying to get through the FDA and into practice with a, a relatively narrow indication and then kind of working from there, it seems that more and more we'll be faced with uh, 
kind of treatments, again, with perhaps a, what would, some people would call a narrow indication um, at the beginning, and that other people will wonder how broad it will get later. Alan, I, yeah, back to you. I was just going to expand on what the second responder said. I think it's uh, arbitrary uh, and should be, it's really how you sorry, using. Sorry, Alan, I apologize. I don't think, can you introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I Alan Rosenberg, are, but, <laughs> uh, Vice President for Medical and Clinical Pharmacy Policy for Anthem. Um, and I think it's an arbitrary cutoff, and so I think about how it gets used for, you know, doing research. Uh, and when we look at policy, if you have a disease with 50 people or 500 people, you expect a different level of uh, ability to enroll people in an RCT than for a disease with 100,000 or 200,000 people. So the research elements vary uh, in part based on the uh, frequency and size and what you might see in terms of outcome measures. Not completely, but uh, some significant differences. Um, as you go along the slope. So, you know, our committees think about that differently based on the uh, constructs. I think the other big difference in this space, though, is obviously the economic in a, in a capital-driven uh, society, the dollars uh, put forward for doing the research and creating economic uh, returns for that. So the Orphan Drug Act, I think, by the FDA was put forward to help encourage that type of uh, uh, research and development. Um, at the same time, I'd say it's probably from a societal point of view makes more sense to say that the society should decide it's worth putting NIH or other funding to rare diseases um, and decide where it is and where they think the uh, opportunities. But it's a resource, a research-based question of where do we put our resources. Um, and as a payer, we don't see that the evidence, and you know, necessarily, unless there are real practical issues with um, bringing a study forward, that the uh, the determination about the evidence should be different based on the type of the um, uh, size of the population. That's an economic issue, and society needs to decide where it wants to encourage or discourage, and any number is then random. Is it that my kid has a disease with uh, 50,000 and we've called ultra-rare 10,000? Does that make me happy that we're favoring diseases with 10,000 or fewer uh, individuals? No. If I have a kid who's got 2,000 uh, in a population of 2,000, I'll be upset that there aren't resources put to it, and society <coughs> needs to address that issue. All right. I feel like opening up a jar, not a swear jar, but a jar in which every time somebody says society will have to decide, we, we put a dollar in and we'll see where we'll get to by the end of the day. I'll put in 10 right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my comments are, uh, my Sorry, name is Perry Shea from UCLA. Thanks. I'm a clinician. Um, so my comments are fairly similar, but I think, it'll, I think it's, it's the, the purpose behind Defining something as orphan is, is the the idea of, is inherently the idea of incentivizing research, um, in in these rare diseases. And so I think that you know what we want to call rare has to do with what we think might potentially be ignored, you know if if you have a completely if I can use the term, level playing field financially, you know, um, so that's that's kind of where the orphan concept comes from, I believe. All right. I just want to point out, I know we tried not to be too uh, kind of uh, heavy on the materials, but at each of your tables we decided just to create a, a small chart just for people to refer to ad, ad hoc, but it shows, um, the, it just does multiplication, the annual cost of a treatment, different levels of 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000 patients, and what the revenue would be if you multiply that annual cost by that number of patients. So to the extent that some of the discussion will focus back on what incentives are needed for innovation, um, we just thought it would be helpful to at least have some of the math done on the table for you. Yes, Michael. Yes, uh, hi, Michael Sherman, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. 
So um, back to how do I think about orphan versus ultra orphan, and let me come at it from an, a different angle, from a different lens. So the numbers are fine and they have some meaning, but what has more meaning in terms of what I do every day is thinking about the impact on our population. So we're a mid-sized plan, about 1.3 million lives. So we treat, um, I, I, what I guess the orphan-like category, as was mentioned, there's wide variations in the numbers, below um, 200,000. But there are those, um, cystic fibrosis would be an example, where we have um, somewhere between 50 and 100 of our members on CF drugs. So that's something where we can kind of treat it like other diseases. There's, there, there's trials, there's evidence we're used to looking at. We, we can develop standard policies and apply them pretty uniformly. Um, when I hear ultra-orphan, uh, in my mind, that, that speaks to cases where we may have one or two or, or no individuals. I'm thinking about some of the prevalences of some of the um, upcoming gene therapies, for example, or some other very rare diseases. In that case, it's very hard for us to get our arms around the evidence, um, um, in, in part, and we'll talk, I know we'll talk about this because it's tough to do traditional clinical trials, but it also means that we don't really have enough members to even think about how do we apply it uniformly, and it becomes less of a um, pure evidence and more of an individual um, process, uh, what we call individual consideration. Uh, which is a great answer, by, by the way, when the press asks, what are you, how are you treating this? It it's seems to be a very safe answer these days. But, uh, but the reality is we do look at the evidence as best we can at the individual, at other factors, um, whether it is, you know, um, I don't know whether it should be a factor, but to the extent that we have one or two, the, the extent to which they're self or fully insured may lead to a discussion with the sponsor, with a self-insured employer explaining the situation. So it, it feels like we treat them differently by virtue of just having to based on the different numbers. Do you think it would be that different if you were a much larger health plan and even on the, the prevalence you suddenly had? 20, 30 of these patients? Is it, is it literally just a scaling issue, or is it? I, th I think it's both. I mean, it is, it is, it, it's hard if you have one or two um, members, and this may, I mean, uh, this has broader implications even for smaller health plans that may have very limited with, with um, treatments, whether it's CAR-T gene therapy, et cetera, that involve centers as well that they won't have the expertise to develop relationships with the COEs. But even beyond that, for getting the scaling issue, um, you still run into the same issue that with the ultra rare is the types of evidence and the quality of evidence mm -hmm. that you're used to looking at that can give you a greater sense of comfort that you're doing the right thing mm -hmm. may not exist. I mean, again, for uh, the lack of randomized clinical trials, which could take many, many, many years to do, which might create ethical quandaries in terms of the people who aren't benefiting. Right. So it, it can be tough to find the right balance there between, again, the, the access affordability issue that we frequently think about as payers. So, yeah, and I, we'll come back to a lot of the great issues you're raising as we go through each of the, the issues. But it, th one of the questions, again, is it's almost like Newtonian mechanics and uh, kind of quantum mechanics. At some point, all of our rules and processes seem to work, and at what level of smallness does something change? And again, we'll, we'll hear about reasons why it shouldn't, and from an ethical perspective it should, but they're, they're, th this is kind of the question of what what spectrum are we on? And going back to Steve's question or p point, it may not just be a, a raw number that helps us make that decision. We may need to try to come up with some criteria that help us decide when we change certain elements of what we do. Yes, yeah, so, and again, that's challenging. And, to, and, and as you alluded to, to make it even more complicated, you frequently go from an approval for one narrow type of, of patient based on certain characteristics to, uh, to um, advocacy groups and, and uh, companies and other elements of society wanting to see it provided more broadly where the evidence may be even more lacking, which makes it even harder to, to, to figure out what is the right thing to do in those circumstances. Okay. Yes, Gordon. I noticed that all the panelists are speaking up first, so you guys who are not panelists <laughs> can definitely grab system. the mic if you want to. Yes, I'm Gordon Smith. I'm a uh, neuromuscular clinician at the University of Utah, and I, I guess I want to emphasize the point that um, you know this isn't a single designation, right? It depends on how you're using the designation, and we're hearing from payer perspectives. There's uh, the issue of the Orphan Drug Act arbitrarily um, codifying 200,000 in order to incentivize uh, therapeutic innovation. 
you know, I'll give you another example um, via Neuronex, which is an NINDS funded clinical trials network, which is designed to fund phase two clinical trials. And one might imagine that a number of the trials that we're asked to consider are for rare diseases, but um, how do you um, um, consider a phase two trial in a disease where there are 5,000 or 500 patients versus 200,000 patients? And so we've had discussions on the executive committee on what's our, what's our threshold, and I don't know that we've used the term ultra-orphan, although we may have, and I can't remember the number we came up with, but we came up with a different number um, than the, the standard designation so that we can fund trials that are phase two, three, recognizing that there aren't enough patients with many of these very rare diseases to do sequential phase two and three trials. And so the point is that the definition is in the eye of the beholder and, and how it's going to be uh, applied, it seems to me. I'm just curious, what, what was the, did you have a threshold for, the, for that distinction? I, yeah, it was, we actually had an absolute number and I think it was in the 5,000 5, range, something like that. So 5,000 patients in the U.S. Yeah, and, okay. and obviously it's just another one of these lines. And I'm sure what will yeah. happen is someone's going to propose a trial for a disorder that, for which there's 6,000 patients and then we'll revisit the. <laughs> I'm sure. Carol, I wanted to uh, introduce and invite Carol Forster, who's a, a pediatrician um, in, the, in the region here for Kaiser and has also worked with their group that considers orphan drugs um, coverage and use uh, over the years. Um, Carol, thank you for being here today. W any perspective that you have on any distinctions that we should be thinking about, criteria we should be thinking about between orphan and ultra-orphan? Sure. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Hi, I'm actually the um, Director of Pharmacy and uh, Therapeutics mm -hmm. and Medication Safety for the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. Um, as the PNT Chair here, um, I join my colleagues. We have one of me in every region, so there's eight of us, as well as clinical pharmacists and um, uh, clinicians who are expert in the field um, who are part of a consultative panel for the program. So we cover about 11.8 million patients in the country. Um, and we felt it was important to have an emerging, emerging therapies consultative panel to um, be able to clinically, this is physician group, clinically review uh, patients who are candidates for these new therapies. And it's not really um, looking at it in the terms of an orphan drug, it's really looking at it in terms of making sure that they are going to receive the best quality of care and that we're choosing the patients wisely and that we have the clinical criteria correct so that we are not wasting anyone's money and that we are appropriately taking care of them and not exposing them to any unnecessary risk with drugs that maybe didn't have a lot of evidence or clinical trials behind them, mm -hmm. and yet they do maybe, in theory, have some great benefit. So we, we felt it was a, so our approaches really didn't change to evaluating drugs, but yet we needed to modify them a little bit because, as was already mentioned, the population here is so small in some of these instances. Now, we have 11.8 million members, but that still might mean we only have 30 patients. So, um, you know, it, it all depends on the, on the disease state, of course. So we did have to modify what we do, for, mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's kind of still the same in that we are using clinical expertise as much as possible. All of our regions have some clinical experts in, in, in particular niches like pediatric, PMNR, neurology clinical genetics, et cetera, et cetera. And we bring those folks all together so that if a region doesn't have a particular specialist, they can share the wealth of the expertise we have in the rest of the country. So, so we, we modified our processes a little bit, but we, we're still kind of doing the same thing. Does that answer the question? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds like in some way you have an organized uh, individual consideration process. I mean, I'm, you know, to, to kind of bl bridge the two. Um, you're treating them as individual patients, and, and as you said, bringing the different experts and the different policies into the room to talk about individual cases. So that's interesting. All right. I want to introduce one other thing. I seem to have gone backwards before we um, have an overview of, of the paper. So, and this again is to help kind of frame, this is, this is exactly the kind of discussion we want to have. And I, I think we'll circle back because as we talk more about the potential differences and how we might approach value assessment, this issue of how and when we decide to, to send a drug assessment down a different track, if you will, we'll kind of, we'll have to revisit this question of, is there a useful distinction between orphan and ultra-orphan, and if so, how to make it? So I guess I want to make the point that when, when we at ICER at least think of the appraisal of ultra-orphan drugs, 
We think of there being a clinical and economic assessment. If you will, even though you know, the economic assessment, there are assumptions always built in because it has to go long term. To a certain extent, this is just the facts, ma'am. That's what this is. Then we have these other benefits and contextual considerations that we include as discussion points, and if there's evidence, we certainly cover that within our report. And then our reports are meant, obviously, for multiple purposes, but there is a lot of discussion and focus on their use for price negotiation, coverage, and payment. Now, basically, ICER's role is at this intersection here. I mean, we do this, and we have to do something around identifying, clarifying, and putting into our reports a discussion about these other factors. And here, again, we'll talk about these during, during the day. What are the other benefits? Are there, is there anything different about the other benefits for orphan or ultra-orphan than for other conditions? Same for, oops, same for considerations of uh, contextual issues. So the question for us is, if we are going to do something different, do we adjust our standards for the strength of evidence? So ICER has an approach. You know, we think about what you know, strong evidence is. We actually have a matrix that says what our certainty is and the net health benefit. Do we somehow take on board, given a certain rarity, we should have a different way of thinking about what good evidence is in our judgments? The similarly, you know, we have thresholds. We have ranges that we discuss for what we consider to be reasonable pricing or pre reasonable value given the long-term benefits to patients. Do we ourselves adjust that when we report out and when we certainly use our reports to suggest value-based price benchmarks? Another question is that when we have each of our reports discussed by an independent council in a public meeting, we guide them very much to wrestle with all of this and to focus a lot on their consideration of other benefits and the contextual considerations. Do we tell them that they should give some priority for rarity? Or do we let them as individuals make their own decision? We have a council, usually it's around 15 to 18 people. And do we tell them or do we let them think about this? Now obviously, both innovators and payers will be thinking about all of this themselves. And when they do price negotiation, when they think about coverage, you've heard discussions of that from some of the payers, and also different payment um, mechanisms. There'll be questions about what they do. So this is the selfish part of, of the day. I'd love to get some thoughts by the end of the day on whether ICER should change anything at all because we could still assume that there should be changes, but it should be the role of the innovator and the payer, or maybe at the CPAC level. But ICER should just keep doing what it's doing, and people who assess the value should put that out, just like it would be for a common condition. Here's what we think of the evidence for a rare condition. Over to other people to make adjustments. Or do we, again, do we take some of this on board, if you will, ourselves? Do we adjust? Do we modulate? Do we comment in some specific way as we, whoops, as we feed this kind of forward? So we'll look for your thoughts on that. So it's not just what we do, but who does it by we, not just kind of what is changed, if anything. So we'll talk a lot about what those changes should be, but also think about when it should happen and by whom. Because somewhere in here, that, that's, that's, if we're going to change anything, it's going to have to be parsed so that we're clear. Because the last thing we want to do is to not be clear. It could be that, again, we decide not to change anything here, but we want to be very clear where that adjustment might happen or, or what. All right, so think about that. And it's time, though, I'd like to introduce to Dr. Dan Ohlendorf, ICER's chief scientific officer, who's going to give us a, a brief overview of the briefing paper that you've got, and again, highlight the things that we think will be most important for the discussion later today. And he'll also join me in front of the <laughs> panel there. Can you hear me? Oh, oh good. Thank you, Steve. So um, 
both Rick Chapman, our Director of Health Economics, and I will talk about the briefing paper today. And hopefully you've had a chance to uh, at least read through some of it before, but I'll go over some of the major themes. Um, those of you who are familiar with ISA reports will hopefully appreciate that I think for the first time in our history, we actually made something brief. So, um, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> but not all of them. Um, so, um, in, because we have a short time to do this, I'm not going to talk about the Spinraza case study in any detail, but that is available in the full paper for your perusal. So let's talk a little bit about some background and definitions. And this really could be kind of a framing in some ways for why we're here today. So while rare diseases are rare, they affect a lot of people. Uh, so 30 million Americans are affected by one of 7,000 uh, rare diseases um, defined as such. And this is also something that um, provides a lot of moral and social context for us to think about because many of these diseases are severely disabling and or fatal. Um, they are very prevalent uh, in many cases in the very young. Uh, and many of them have few or no treatment alternatives available. So there are societal impulses at play here that have to be considered. And we'll be talking about that a lot today, I'm sure. In addition, there have been a lot of recent advances in treatment of cystic fibrosis, various dystrophies, rare cancers, and other conditions that have really spurred significant development in drugs to treat orphan, uh, orphan drugs to treat rare conditions. Um, there are also other issues at play here, including incentives. We'll talk about those uh, in a bit as well. So another reason that this is part of the conversation is that orphan drugs are, in fact, big business. So they're projected to be represent one-fifth of all prescription drug sales by 2020. And in addition, a lot of the considerations from the payer community come into play when you're thinking about um, the actual cost of these drugs. So this is a, an estimate of reimbursed cost. So this is uh, cost after discounts and rebates. Um, and the average cost per patient on an annual basis for an orphan drug is about five times that uh, of a non-orphan drug. So, um, so we've got to figure out how to pay for these as well. That's obviously something we'll be talking about today. So we touched on this a bit. I'll go, th go through this quickly because we already discussed this in some detail, but there's variability in definition for what a rare condition is. Not that much variability from the regulator standpoint. So in three major jurisdictions, the FDA, the EU, and Japan, the range is between 40 and 60 per 100,000 in terms of the definition of a rare disease. When you get down to the level of an individual stakeholder, however, um, there is much more variability. So in a recent publication, uh, the estimates range from 5 to 76 per 100,000. Um, most people won't be surprised by the fact that payers tended to use the more restrictive definitions of rare diseases. Patient groups use more liberal definitions. There's even less consistency. We just talked about this in what is, where is that continuum between rare and ultra rare or ultra orphan? And in addition, are we talking about a defined disease or are we talking about some sort of a subset of a more prevalent condition often defined by biomarkers? So biomarkers are being increasingly used to define um, discrete subsets of patients. Uh, yesterday, I think the FDA approved a drug for cancer, for example, that was biomarker defined for the first time, did not require a, a cancer site to be defined. So biomarker subsets are going to be more and more prevalent uh, in terms of thinking about disease definitions. Now we get to the ethical context. So there are lots of considerations at play here. Many of them, however, are not actually related to rarity um, specifically at all. So again, rare conditions are often severe, disabling, and life-threatening. That triggers lots of moral and societal impulses. But that's the case for non-rare diseases as well. Um, there are prominent examples of diseases that affect young children. Again, those impulses are triggered, not necessarily tied directly to rarity in all cases. 
There's also a significant impact on families and caregivers, which can also be the case for Alzheimer's disease, much more common, for example, and other more prominent uh, common examples. Uh, in this particular case, um, just as a factoid, a recent estimate of the annual cost of care for a child with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is about $120,000 per year, and less than half of those costs were actually direct medical. So many of those costs were borne by family members and informal caregivers and other indirect costs as well. Related to rarity, however, we have the conundrum of a high per patient research and development cost from the perspective of the manufacturer, a high price, and oftentimes that leads to prices that generate cost effectiveness estimates that almost always exceed commonly used and cited cost effectiveness thresholds. So in ICER's general work, we focus on cost effectiveness ranges between 50 and 150,000 per quality adjusted life year or quality gained. And in many cases, uh, the high prices of these drugs may not um, achieve those thresholds. So uh, the question becomes, what actually is a fair way to approach this? What is fair? So under the assumption that the overall goal of the health system is health gain for the population, and that every dollar we spend on a particular aspect of healthcare for one patient could be used for other patients uh, or for other social goals in the, the system generally, we then have to think about two distinct and in some ways opposing views of fairness. One would be treat everybody the same. So this is the question that Steve posed to you at the beginning of the conversation. Treating everyone the same, use the same standards for judging value and for allocating resources across all conditions to try to maximize overall health gain for the population, or pay a premium. So set some a different sort of standard to ensure that all patients get a chance at a meaningful health gain, even if what that means is that there will be less overall health for the population and that some patients with less visible conditions, so conditions that have not been um, discussed or prominent um, in the media or in other conversations, um, may the opportunity cost here is for those patients who don't have as visible a set of symptoms or as visible a condition um, who may not have the opportunity to get treatment that they need. So there, uh, there is a concern there as well. So that's, that's the ethical context, the conundrum that we find ourselves in. So let's talk a little bit about the regulatory landscape and then we'll talk a little bit about payer and HTA landscape both here in the US as well as abroad. The Orphan Drug Act of 1983 was intended to provide incentives for increased development of drugs for rare diseases. So prior to the passage of the act, uh, very few drugs had been developed for rare diseases. I believe FDA approval rates were one or less per year. Um, and when this act was passed, um, there were incentives provided to manufacturers, R&D tax credits, uh, extended market exclusivity, research grants for phase one through three clinical trials, uh, user fee waivers as well. Uh, a similar set of incentives has been developed in the EU. As a result of the Orphan Drug Act here, we now have over 600 drugs approved using the orphan designation. So that rate of approval is now about 20 per year on average. Faster approvals as well. So the FDA has a number of fast track processes for approval and many drugs with orphan designations go through one or more of these accelerated pathways and increased use of surrogate outcomes. Now, in some cases, surrogate outcomes are really all that can be measured for a particular condition, um, but we're seeing that with this faster approval, uh, we have shortened duration of clinical trials in some settings and increased use of surrogates as well. So challenges in understanding the evidence base when approaching it from a traditional standpoint. So there have been some concerns about abuses of the Orphan Drug Act as well. So most prominently, uh, three Republican senators have initiated a process where the Government Accountability Office is conducting an investigation to understand whether manufacturers are using uh, the multiple indication allowance in the Orphan Drug Act to exploit the incentives. 
uh, essentially to get an orphan designation, get all of those incentives, but end up using the drug in much more prevalent populations. So some concerns there as well. So turning to the payer and HTA landscape, and first in thinking about the US specifically, um, private US payers, a recent survey that was actually highlighted in the briefing paper um, suggested that commercial payers were concerned about the growing number of orphan approvals and the potential cost implications associated with that, and they have no clue about what to do. So uh, they're not really sure how to create a process for economic evaluation um, to try to understand and deal with these situations. Um, so there's not a lot of um, strategy around how to try to deal with this. Issues may even be more pronounced with Medicaid. So this is the largest single insurer of children in the US, and I mentioned these conditions affect children in, uh, to a large degree. Um, 11 of the 50, 50 costliest drugs to Medicaid in a recent survey um, had achieved orphan drug status at some point in their development. So orphan drugs represent a big um, uh, bottom line issue for Medicaid already. Medicaid state-based system with federal supplementation that um, has had budgets coming under increased pressure uh, mm -hmm. from a, a variety of angles. And in fact, we're also facing the potential for those budgets to be cut even further uh, in the current environment. And so uh, there are challenges that are going to be uh, in place for Medicaid now and, and for the foreseeable future. Um, Medicaid is allowed to use techniques like prior authorization to try to manage the costs of drugs, um, but statutorily they are required to allow use of drugs uh, within the, indica the approved indi indication by the FDA. And there have been some legal challenges to uh, Medicaid prior authoriz authorization criteria in the rare disease space uh, because it's felt that some, in some cases these challenges have gone over the top. So a recent example in Arkansas, a cystic fibrosis drug prior authorization criteria that required use of older, less effective treatments first uh, before this uh, particular agent for a specific subset of the CF population, and that was overturned in court. So let's turn to international efforts, and I've got some um, kind of focus on the approach that's um, used by a number of different countries and how that varies. On this slide, on the next slide, I've got some data to show um, how the difference in approaches actually correlates with assessment rates for orphan drugs. So in England, there has been formalized assessment of drugs for, I guess, what could be defined as ultra-rare conditions a prevalence of one in 50,000. Um, but the, uh, the HTA body, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the UK, um, has had historically low assessment rates, about three drugs per year with orphan status evaluated. There's always been thinking around contextual factors that go beyond uh, traditional assessments in non-orphan areas. So the impact of disease on patients and caregivers, the benefits outside of the National Health Service or social care that might be part of the use of a particular drug. And now there's a newly proposed approach where NICE will actually increase the threshold for cost effectiveness for drugs considered under this highly specialized technologies program to be about four to five times higher than their threshold for non-orphan conditions. We'll also weight substantial gains in quality adjusted life years that might be apparent from use of a drug. Um, so extra weighting applied to those clinical benefits. But then also sub, uh, subject orphan drugs and non-orphan drugs for that matter to a budget impact threshold that the National Health Service will use. Um, so that is uh, something that's in the process of implementation now. In other situations, things are a little bit less formalized. So. Sweden has a, a, a philosophy for approaching um, health technology assessment of any drug, whether that's orphan or non-orphan, that has three principles applied to it. So a human dignity principle, a need solidarity principle, and cost effectiveness. So essentially, uh, there's a requirement that um, individuals who might be disadvantaged with 
um, a rare condition have consideration of the severity of that condition and the disabling potential of that condition that might provide extra weight in the assessor's mind. There's not really a standard or a threshold for that assessment, uh, but that is something that has to be considered um, in all situations. But uh, this is not something that could be considered at an unlimited cost. So cost effectiveness is as important a principle um, as the other two. So there's not been a stated threshold in this kind of a situation um, for consideration of a uh, drug for a rare condition, but in practice, the thresholds that have been applied are between 35,000 and 100,000 euros per quali, um, which is substantially higher than the thresholds that have been considered in less severe and more common conditions. There are a number of other jurisdictions, so they're listed here, France, Germany, Scotland, um, that don't actually think about cost effectiveness at all when they're thinking about rare conditions. Um, they've kind of felt like, um, as we've noted earlier, that it's unlikely that many of these therapies would approach a common cost effectiveness threshold. And so they think primarily on what the potential budget impact is of a new entrant for a rare condition, as well as some additional allowance um, or some leeway around interpretation of the statistical and clinical evidence. So p-values of 0 0.10 or less, whereas in traditional assessments, it's 0 0.05 or less, as an example. So how is this variability actually played out? And you see here that there's some correlation, but it's not really perfect correlation. So this is a, a review of the activity level of HTA organizations in eight European countries uh, for the 101 orphan drugs that, ha that were approved by the European Medicines Agency over a 13-year period. You see that England, in fact, has the lowest rate of assessment. So only 20% of these um, 101 drugs were assessed, uh, but a relatively high rate of positive and or conditionally positive recommendations for adoption and use in the setting, uh, and 100% reimbursement rate. As you move down the chain a bit, you see Sweden actually has a very, has a higher rate of assessment, um, a very high rate of positive or conditionally positive recommendations, and also 100% reimbursement rate. But when you get into the settings where the uh, conditions or the, the um, interpretation of the data is a little bit more loose. So France, for example, which again doesn't have a cost effectiveness approach, looks at budget impact and some statistical leeway only. High rate of assessment, 74%. Of those, 94% were recommended for positive or conditionally positive uh, use in the, the country, but only 28% were reimbursed. So. Um, again, not a perfect correlation, but there is definitely an interplay here that we need to think about between um, the volume or throughput that an organization um, like one of these or like ours needs to think about, as well as um, if they're going to be positive recommendations, what the ultimate reality is in terms of uh, the ability to reimburse for those drugs. So let me turn it over to Rick for the next segment, and then I guess we can both take questions if there's time. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about some of the methodological issues that arise in the economic evaluation of treatments for rare diseases. So some challenges with the clinical evidence. Um, clinical inputs are often difficult to obtain with great certainty because for a lot of these diseases, there's a lack of standard patient-reported outcome measures or patient-centered outcome measures. There's often difficulties in validating surrogate outcomes, which may need to be used for some of these diseases. Uh, because these diseases are, are so rare, especially for ultra-rare conditions, there may not be good standardization on what usual standard care is, so it may be hard to find comparators for some treatments. And uh, for a lot of these treatments, there may be no novel mechanisms of action that raise questions of long-term effects and safety, especially given the short duration of trials for a lot of these treatments. <clears throat> all of these different factors and, and the small numbers of patients that are available for study 
lead to often to greater uncertainty around these treatments. Uh, and this is sometimes exacerbated by the shorter accelerated approvals that uh, these treatments go through. So all of that can lead to wider confidence intervals and more uncertainty around uh, the, the net health benefits of treatments. Um, that may be offset to some extent by a greater societal tolerance for risk. Uh, we may be able to accept greater risk for certain groups of patients uh, given this uncertainty and lack of uh, available treatments and the unmet need for these conditions. Um, and there may be some thought that the budget impact uh, because of the small numbers of patients uh, will not be that, that high uh, if it does turn out that the net health benefit is not what was expected. <clears throat> So there's also some challenges in evaluating the cost effectiveness of these rare diseases. As I mentioned, there's, there's often greater uncertainty in the clinical effectiveness and the outcomes from that. Uh, and in quality of life, uh, we've heard that these, these diseases often impact young children or infants. It's very difficult to evaluate quality of life for these types of uh, populations. And the effects on caregivers and families are often pronounced for these diseases. Uh, but it's infrequently assessed in economic evaluations or, um, or clinical trials. Cost, uh, because these conditions are so rare, the patterns of spending for patients over time may not be very well known. And all of this leads to difficulties in doing cost effectiveness analyses and may lead to higher thresholds uh, when we do look at cost-effectiveness analyses or higher rate cost-effectiveness ratios. Traditional orphan pricing may make it difficult but not impossible to match up to cost-effectiveness thresholds for more prevalent conditions. Uh, as Dan mentioned, there's smaller populations here over which to spread the fixed cost of research and development, so it's harder to, to recapture those costs. And uh, the cost-effectiveness thresholds are typically dependent on life extension quality of life improvement, and cost offsets from reduced needs for other healthcare services. And uh, these may be uh, difficult to measure in these types of conditions. Uh, it did mention that it's difficult to often to hit cost effectiveness thresholds, but it's not impossible. A recent study uh, looked at cost effectiveness analyses for 19 different <coughs> orphan drugs and actually looked at 61 incremental cost effectiveness ratios from those analyses and found quite a large range from uh, very cost effective at approximately $9,000 per quality up to uh, over a million dollars per quality. Uh, but interesting, the medi interestingly, the median uh, ICER here was $55,000 per quality, and 10 of the 19 drugs would have been considered cost effective at NICE's threshold of 30,000 pounds per quality. So because of these issues, there have been some proposed modifications to how we do cost effectiveness analyses for rare diseases. Uh, <clears throat> one suggestion has been just not to do cost effectiveness analysis to say that uh, economic evaluations are not appropriate for rare diseases. And as Dan mentioned, some countries have uh, chosen to go this route and don't really consider cost effectiveness for these types of diseases. There have also been calls for higher cost effectiveness thresholds. Uh, and this is thought that uh, it would reflect a possible societal preference for treatment of rare diseases over more common conditions, uh, implying a greater willingness to pay from society. Uh, however, others have pointed out that this implies the different valuation of health improvements for patients with rare diseases than with common ones. Um, you're in, in essence, there's an opportunity cost of treating those rare diseases, which is reduced treatments for other types of conditions. Um, and when you actually go out and try to pre go out and try to measure whether there is a societal preference for treatment of rare diseases, the evidence is actually pretty inconsistent. Uh, very mixed uh, bag of uh, studies out there. And if a higher threshold is considered, there's no consensus on the methods to determine how much higher it should be based on rarity alone. And uh, I will point out that usually when a different threshold is, uh, is, is put out there, 
it's usually only one threshold which doesn't vary by the rarity of the disease or the severity of the disease. Beyond cost effectiveness analysis, uh, th there are other contextual factors and benefits and disadvantages, as Steve mentioned, that we, we need to consider. These may be especially important in rare diseases, and we may consider that if rare diseases, because of the, the uncertainty around clinical effectiveness and economic evaluations, these may be especially important for, for these types of conditions. So whether, whether you're using a higher cost effectiveness threshold or not, uh, it's important to have a formal inclusion of information on those other potential benefits and disadvantages and any relevant contextual considerations. Uh, there are many different ways to integrate those other benefits into value assessments. Those can range from very informal, ad hoc, subjective ratings of different considerations to a fully specified, very formal, multi-criteria decision analysis where there are pre-specified domains that are considered and weights are assigned in a very formal way to that. Uh, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to each with the ad hoc informal. Uh, people worry about the subjectivity of ratings that decision makers may be doing. Uh, and there's also a concern that there may not be an accountability for reasonableness, that certain uh, decisions may be inconsistent, logically inconsistent across treatments or that um, people may put too much weight on one particular aspect for one treatment, but not as much weight on it for another treatment. Uh, some of the, the problems with the fully specified multi-criteria decision analysis, uh, while it's very transparent and, and formal and scientifically rigorous in some ways, there's also uh, a burden to trying to do that kind of assessment. It's very difficult for people to do. Um, and there is concern that the, the way that that system is formalized and the weights that are used could potentially channel debate into certain directions um, that might be lost if you had a more informal process. I think that's the last. So um, thank you guys. So I was, do, does anybody have any specific questions about the, the presentations of, around the briefing paper? Anything they wanted to add or bring up? Okay. Oh, yes, sure. I think we've stolen your. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe this was your uh, effort to keep me, uh, keep me quiet at the meeting. I'm not putting a mic on this table. <laughs> um, anyway, this is Chris Leibman uh, from Biogen. Um, and I just want to make a comment. I think, you know, first off, Dan and the team, I think you guys did a fantastic job summarizing a tremendous amount going on in Europe. Um, I came here, Biogen asked me to come from Europe. Um, I work in Europe um, all the time, and I think part of the reason they asked me to be here was there's many things that I think the U.S. could learn from Europe, but there's also many areas where we should learn from them and, and lead. And I think the one area that, um, Dan, you summarized some of the CEA focus. I think the other area, um, as they've wrestled with this framework in a number of countries, is the emphasis that they've put either explicitly or if just in behavior on budget impact and affordability, where they've actually either eliminated the traditional cost effectiveness use. And I think um, in your paper and even in your summary, you did a nice job of elucidating some of the limits of standard economic technique as it relates specifically to rare. So I just want to highlight that because the budget impact and affordability in many countries becomes overemphasized compared to their standard method. I think it's something important for the consideration around the framework. So I'm just curious from your comment, for a second I was kind of thinking one way and then I, so you're suggesting that at least in some European systems you think they do too much emphasis on the budget impact and they should bring back in a consideration of cost effectiveness? Or do you think, you think the lesson to be learned from Europe is to think about leaving cost effectiveness and just talking about budget impact? No, I think the important piece for me is some of the countries have, as you said earlier, relaxed or changed the criteria by which they take their typical HTA process mm -hmm. and apply different criteria. And I think the learnings from what you see in some of the debate happening in even those countries is the techniques or the economic techniques aren't customized to orphan drugs. 
And for that reason, then they've either explicitly, or in some cases, if you look in their behaviors, they've put the emphasis then to say, okay, we've done our process, but we will look more carefully and closely at the budget impact and affordability as being a driver. And so I think that's important to consider as you get into the framework on how are orphans different and specific mm -hmm. on the methods used, whether we put energy into the cost effectiveness or to the contextual considerations and how they apply to the budget impact. Okay, thank you. David? Thank you. I'm David Mitchell. I'm uh, with a group, new group called Patients for Affordable Drugs. Um, we are the only national patient organization focused exclusively on working for policies to lower drug prices. We don't take money from anybody who profits from the development and distribution of prescription drugs. I'm also here as a multiple myeloma patient. Uh, drugs are keeping me alive. I'm relapsed. And the drugs that I get, a two-drug combination, costs uh, $450,000 a year. So there's a very real discussion you guys are having today. It's not theoretical for me. Um, but I feel like I'm trapped in a bad framework and a bad set of assumptions, and I want to put a different uh, approach on the table. And I want to ask why we don't ask this question. So the analysis that was just presented is excellent, uh, but we, we wind up having a discussion about the ethics of pitting patients against patients and uh, reimbursement by insurance companies uh, at different levels for different people. Why don't we ask what is the ethical level of profitability that should come from the development of a drug. Right now we have an orphan drug framework under 1983 that treats all orphan drugs equally. So if I'm under 200,000 population, I develop a drug, I get all the benefits that come with it. If I invest, and by the way, it's worked very well. I'm taking orphan drugs to keep me alive. I'm really happy for the Orphan Drug Act, but it's not working right now because we can find a biomarker that uh, works on a gene for the disease I have, find it in another cancer, and move it over with no investment in research, no risk, and the manufacturer not only gets all the benefits of the Orphan Drug Act, but all the monopoly pricing power that's involved. So I want to put on the table whether in thinking about how orphan drugs are handled in a system of care for people and for the system overall, how we work in what is a fair return, an ethical return. We're going to ask ethical questions about who should get it, who shouldn't. Why don't we ask an ethical question about what is a fair return on investment for drugs? And this is a question that is um, dealt with for other sectors in the economy. The insurers here have to subscribe to limits on loss ratios. Doctors' payments are set based on recommendations for the RUC that are adopted by Medicare that flow down through the whole system. We have other ways that we decide what our fair reimbursement levels, fair returns on investment uh, or on costs, uh, and yet we don't apply it in this discussion to prescription drug pricing. And instead, we have whatever the market will bear. So I want to suggest that I want to move this discussion, or at least want in ICER's criteria, what did it cost to develop the drug and what is a fair return on investment for the investors and the company that brought the drug to market? Absent that, we're leaving out a huge factor uh, and not taking that into account in developing what is the fair way for a drug to be priced. I, I knew you wouldn't ask a stimulating question I know, or make a comment. Um, Rather than do what I know what I could do, which is to ask for other responses or other comments that would uh, take over the next two hours, I really appreciate the comment. And I want to bring it into the discussion with the, the panel that I'd like to invite up now on the ethical kind of con contextual issues, because we should be able to address it right then. So if I could ask those panelists to come up while I introduce them. So do we have, yeah, you guys go ahead and, you guys go ahead and mount the stage there.
Jim, John, why don't you guys come on up? And Diane, thanks. All right. With thanks to them in advance, let me just introduce them again. So, uh, or for the first time, Diane Barry is uh, the Vice President for Government Affairs and Global Health Policy at Sarepta Therapeutics. Paul Melmeyer, everybody can see Paul, is the Director of Federal Policy at the National Organization for Rare Diseases, or NORD, as many of you know it. Uh, Jim Sabin, who many of you may not have known before today, but you probably have been influenced by his work around setting limits fairly, um, accountability for reasonableness. He's also a very a close personal friend and mentor of mine um, back at Harvard. He's the clinical professor um, in the departments of population medicine and psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and he directs the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Ethics Program. And last but not least, John Watkins, who is also, a, uh, he's already introduced himself to you, but he's the formulary manager for Primera Blue Cross on the West Coast. So, David just posed obviously a very um, kind of interesting perspective, um, and I wonder if anybody would like to, to comment on it. We have other things that we want to cover, but what's your, what's your general take on that? Uh, Paul, do you mind if I start with you? The consideration of how and if the kind of fair or ethical profit or return on investment should factor into a, a view on assessing rare drugs or drugs for rare conditions? So I'd actually like to, to first touch on the Orphan Drug Act piece of, of his comment, and specifically, if it's been working, is it working, is it now being abused? Um, over the last year or so, there have been plenty of commentary on the Orphan Drug Act, and if the addition of orphan indications onto drugs that are being more widely used is inherently an abuse of the Orphan Drug Act. And the assumption then is that the, as, as David was saying, the monopoly power and the other incentives that come along with the Orphan Drug Act are then applied to the full drug. That this is inappropriately giving these incentives to a therapy that is being used widely, that is, um, that, that is then the all indications within that drug is benefiting from the monopoly power, from the tax incentives, from the other, in, the other benefits that come along with an orphan designation. And that simply, in our understanding at the very least, is not the case. The seven years of exclusivity that come along with an orphan indication is applied to that specific orphan indication. The orphan drug tax credit, the qualified clinical expenses that qualify for the orphan drug tax credit are tied to the indication specifically. So we see this actually in the real world with biologics and biosimilars starting to come onto the market. Of biosimilars for biologics entering the market, or at least soon to enter the market, that have common disease indications, but the rare indication within those biologics are still protected. And so we see the orphan indication on that biologic not interfering with the entrance of biosimilars, this happens in drugs as well, not interfering with the entrance of generics. So simply there is, that monopoly power does not extend to the rest of the common indications within the drug or the orphan indications that have already expired for that matter. So th that, that's something that we've had plenty of discussions on with those in the media, with those in policy, uh, those decision makers, that uh, there seems to be a misunderstanding in some places on the incentives within the Orphan Drug Act. I probably don't want to take us down that uh, discussion line, but we, we can circle back to it, I think. Um, the part of the discussion, and we can feel free to weave in that issue as well, but kind of the, the, one of the main issues we wanted to try to wrestle with, with your guys' perspectives, is the very basic question of whether we should do something different for treatments of rare or ultra-rare conditions. Um, from an ethical perspective, what are the reasons to do that, and what are the reasons not to do that? Um, Jim, can I invite you, because sure. I know you've been part of Many of you will remember human gro growth hormone and some of the earliest kind of orphan treatments way back when, before they were probably even called that. Um, but from the years of your experience and, and, and knowledge of the kind of the ethical landscape, what, are, what do you think are some of the strongest arguments for and against treating these treatments differently? Well, the, the issue that uh, ICER has framed for us today really goes back millennia because it's the basic it's the basic issue of individual needs and population needs. And 
th this is at the core of what our species has to deal with. So there's nothing new about this, but it's totally highlighted by orphan drugs, uh, and even by the term orphan, which conjures up the view of the vulnerable individual as it, as it should. So the basic conflict is uh, we're committed to fair access for individuals. A compassionate society uh, tries to leave no one out from the p potential of full opportunity. And at the same time, a society is full of a wide range of needs uh, which can be swallowed up by large expenditures around individuals. So there's nothing more fundamental in this, than this conflict. Just to put it into uh, a just a, a, the context of work that I and my <coughs> colleague at the Harvard School of Public Health, Norm Daniels, did. Uh, when we set out to study the limit setting process, we asked medical directors and other leaders of, of organizations, how can we be useful? They said, give us a gold standard that tells us what we should cover and what we shouldn't. And what we concluded is what Steve said earlier today, there isn't a gold standard. What societies need and what we're doing here today is uh, processes for grappling with this irreducible conflict, it won't go away. It's not like an issue that goes to a jury where a decision is made and that's it, it's done with. Uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing learning curve. So Steve, I won't say more now, you can guide us as you wish. Well, we'll head in different directions. Diane, what are your thoughts about this different or not different? Do you want to be treated differently by, uh, I mean, do you feel like you're being treated differently by FDA? Do you feel like when FDA looks at a package of clinical information, um, do they bend? I, you know, the word standard is very tough to use in Washington because no one wants to think that standards are changing without it being explicitly d designated as such. But we've heard, and we'll hear more about the, the, the clinical packages that come into the payers and the assessors. Do you feel like it is being treated differently, it should be treated differently um, from, a, from a kind of an ethical or larger contextual consideration? I do, absolutely. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I, I do think FDA is taking into account the contextual considerations as they should around rare diseases and ultra rare diseases. I think, um, I mean, if you just look at accelerated approval, um, you know, let me just clarify, there is one single standard all medicines have to meet, one single standard for safety and efficacy. Um, now, the regulators have developed mechanisms to allow for flexibility in, in achieving that standard and, and how they look at different types and quantity of, of evidence. Um, and I, so, you know, I do think they're, they're, they're doing it right. They're looking at different contextual considerations like understanding the disease, um, account, which means like accounting for the severity and the rarity of the disease, whether there's therapeutic options available. And actually this was codified by Congress in, in the FIDESIA legislation of 2012, um, which codified accelerated approval and encouraged its broader use uh, to rare diseases. And you know, basically told FDA you have to account for these additional factors in granting accelerated approval while still maintaining your standards for safety and efficacy. So definitely understanding the disease is one of the considerations. Um, understanding the impact on patients, looking at the, the patient needs and, and the burdens on the patients and families. And this is another thing that I think FDA is really embracing. Um, can, I just, can I just interject? <laughs> sure. That sounds like we should have that for all conditions. Understanding the disease, understanding the impact on families, whether there are other treatments available. What's special about being rare? Um, well, I think one of the defining characteristics of many rare diseases is um, they're severe and progressive. Um, it, you're, you're gonna have a, what's unique is the small number, and it makes it harder to generate the typical evidence that you know, payers or regulators would like to see from large randomized uh, 
controlled trials. Um, and so I think this is where some of the flexibility has to come in in looking at the different types of inputs um, beyond the clinical evidence. And, and, you know, as I was saying before, patient input is an important thing. And I think everything that FDA is doing uh, in accounting for these contextual considerations, I, I think the, the kind of the payer and the assessment environment, too, could benefit from looking at those. Uh, considerations as well. All right, so much good. So John, uh, people may not know that in your formulary design, you have explicit consideration of social and ethical values, do you call them, or issues? So I'd, I'd love your perspective on rarity. Um, are, are we conflating rarity with severity with other things, or, or is it all one package? How, how do you grapple with it, and how do you see it? Certainly a factor. I think, first of all, my background is clinical. I just have two million patients now instead of a much smaller number that I used to have, but I care about them at the individual level. And even in a relatively common disease like that is serious, you can take more common type of cancer, for example. It doesn't qualify as an orphan disease, and yet you may have two people with the same chart medically that have completely different goals for the remainder of their life. You know, they may have a year or two of expected survival. What do you want to do with that? What's important to you? And unfortunately, the price of these things has driven to a point where it forces us to be more and more restrictive. And that's where I think if we could moderate the pricing, a lot of these issues would be less. So to answer your question, we have a um, formulary process that includes a consideration of cost effectiveness. Uh, we have, first of all, we have thresholds, yes, but they're flexible thresholds, which means that the committee, which consists of a mixture of clinicians and health economists and a couple of people who are both uh, as well as we have a lay member in that group too, but they consider contextual factors. We actually, interestingly, we have a value framework of our own which predated ICERS but has many of the same components that your list of contextual factors and other considerations is a bit longer, but we would look at those in an individual case, and rarity is one of the factors that comes into it. There is a higher set of thresholds that these are used to determine tiering, and essentially it drops down one level. Um, if you have a, a rare disease, or a, we just call it special case circumstances. So it's up to the committee in a given situation to decide what that is. Uh, I threw out a number of 10,000 prevalence before. That's just really, that's a point at which I start looking more critically at that factor. Doesn't necessarily mean that that's a hard line, but what we want to avoid is a situation where you're driven into, uh, you're locked into an answer just based on a mindless mathematical calculation. So, and that's some of the risk if you get too rigid in a, in a formal MCDA. So mm -hmm. we've, we've debated actually whether to develop a, an MCDA process and haven't gone there yet, but it's, it has some things to recommend it. All right. So I, I've been in meetings um, over the years in my own training in, in ethics where I've heard absolutely impassioned, principled arguments that treating rarity differently is unethical. That basically you are implicitly saying that there's something special about this one person, but you're ignoring the other people, and if, if you're dealing with some kind of implicit idea of trade-offs, that you really are being unfair if you say, I'm going to give you more than your fair share because we're not gonna get as much health for you as we could get from the three other patients we could treat with the same resources. I've heard that expressed, again, not from someone who's trying to save money or, or anything else, from a kind of an ethical perspective of thinking logically as this person or people would view it. So that's one side of the spectrum. The other is, from an ethical perspective, and here's where I'm trying to, to press a little bit, and we'll start to get your guys' thoughts too. 
the ethical perspectives start to run the gamut from it's severe, it's, it's, it's this, and, and then it gets very practical. The practical side that's brought in is we can't get the same levels of evidence because we can't do big randomized trials. The practical becomes we can't get enough money to go back to the manufacturer if we use our usual approaches, and we will not have innovation for the ultra-rare conditions. So you can't have fairness when it's viewed as w in one direction and have anything to give to people with rare or ultra-rare conditions. So there are these two really broad poles, if you will, of perspective. Um, so again, I'm, I'm kind of curious on, on your thoughts on, on where you think it, those who are assessing the evidence and how we bring this through a process, where sh how should we grapple with these two ends of the spectrum, Steve, I guess? If you would hold that pose, that would be <laughs> helpful. Probably not uh, all day, yeah. And if we could bring Aristotle into the room from 2,500 years ago, uh, he would say, there is justice in each of those impassioned perspectives. Is it right uh, to seek medications for David so that he can be here in the meeting? Absolutely. And is it right to be concerned about the invisible people who might uh, suffer in ways that we don't see directly? Absolutely. So what, what do we do? These, this isn't good versus evil. It's good versus good. And Aristotle had a rather practical idea that has come down as the golden mean, uh, which essentially says we've got to pay attention to both, that an ethical society will not ch choose one over the other. Uh, it will devote itself to both. So then what? I mean. That's nice in principle, but people have to take action. And there, um, my own specialty is psychiatry. So I bring in Freud, his concept of how change occurs. It doesn't occur in a linear lightning bolt strikes with the right answer. It occurs in a somewhat sloppy process that he called working through. And a again, I go back to what David said, which which is, I think a nice example of what's at stake. He brought up uh, a perspective. Uh, he challenged us to think about that perspective. He connected it to personal experience. And so, uh, again, if we have Steve uh, back in that posture, in each hand he has justice. In each hand he has true values. Uh, we can't throw out either, and we need to recognize both and recognize that this is an area of uncertainty. We, as John said, uh, we can't solve it mathematically. Mathematics can contribute, but it won't give the answer. And we have to uh, work through by taking uh, examples, doing the best we can, making decisions and learning from them and going on from there. And as Steve pointed out earlier, that's not a process that this country is terribly good at uh, uh, around our neighborhood these days. Good. At least you didn't call for a social dialogue. That's good. <laughs> that's no, what but we're trying to have. So, um, John, I'm, I actually am going to pick on you to also address, in a sense, David's comment, because his, his point, as I take it, is Part of the contextual consideration maybe should be how much the drug company invested in developing the drug, how much, I mean, I'm not sure if you were considering actual profit or revenue, but the risk that they might have taken. Is that a contextual consideration that should drive a part of the decision making around the value assessment of these drugs? I think it should be, and as I've looked at examples, until relatively recent times, that is more how healthcare has been priced. My great grandfather was a country doctor on the plains of the Midwest, and most of his patients were sharecroppers. Um, according to what one of his daughters wrote, their family was cash poor, but they had awfully good food to eat because people paid in whatever they had. 
and he went and he provided care with the best he could to meet their needs. So if you applied the cost effectiveness standard that we use, um, I did a little exercise with the threshold uh, willingness to pay of 50000 per quali, and I concluded that an appendectomy in a 10-year-old child should be worth about $1.6 million. So we would bankrupt the healthcare system if we priced all life-saving interventions for children at that price. It might be severe infection with a relatively inexpensive antibiotic. You know, it happens all the time but we can't do that, and why should this be different is the question if you can get a reasonable profit. And again, that begs the question what that is. But I think, to me, rarity is less of an issue ethically than the severity of the condition. Um, common diseases that are very severe, classic example is HIV, AIDS. Uh, many of you are young enough that you don't remember life before effective antiretroviral therapy, but I watched patients die when I was clinical pharmacist. And it's heartbreaking, and then all of a sudden, within less than half a year, that, that world changed. People stopped dying. So those are large volume therapies, but they're very life-saving. I think we also need a question that has not been raised, I don't think yet, is, is the therapy real? We, we talk about a breakthrough designation that the FDA has. A breakthrough to me is not a breakthrough unless it actually breaks through something. So you can argue about a p-value of 0 0.05 versus 0 0.1. If a therapy is truly effective, you're not asking that question. The difference is obvious. And you will see statistical significance even with a pretty small n. Uh, you could have taken a small number of HIV patients and treated them effectively, and guess what? It, even relatively late-stage patients are alive and doing well five years later, whereas they would have been dead. So when you see a large effect size, that's a factor. Yeah, I, I, we're gonna come back to the effect size issue um, later in the day because, yeah, because some, of, yeah, some, of the, some of the systems internationally have tried to figure out how to do cost effectiveness with, in a sense, a super weighting uh, to the qualities gained if it's a major kind of improvement as opposed to an incremental improvement. So but, but that's a good point. And Diane, I, I yeah, could, please, um, please. build upon what, what John was saying. He referenced HIV and AIDS, and I think there's a lot we can learn from some of the advances that have been made over time in, in those fields. Um, you know, I don't think we'd be where we are today if it weren't for accelerated approval and many oncology drugs, HIV drugs, you know, are approved based on surrogate outcomes. So I think this is an, an important mechanism, um, you know, that, you know, likewise uh, patients in, in, in the rare disease area can also benefit from. I was gonna ask you, so from a contextual ethical perspective, the cost of development of, of the drug, is that something that innovators would like to see considered as part of the contextual considerations around the value assessment? Um, I, I think we need to be careful as we think about different approaches. I, I um, definitely think there are many of the drugs in the orphan and the ultra-orphan space come after decades of investment in research, you know, billions of dollars spent, lots of time, um, and many of these companies aren't profitable for, for many years. So I think we need to be careful today when we talk about different approaches to assessing value and make sure that we're not curbing the innovation that's happening and disincentivizing some of that innovation. So I want to push you a little bit off that talking point. <laughs> that's a talking point. We all have them. We don't want to disincentivize innovation. We have to be able to afford it. We're working on how to assess the value. So. Um, I'm not sure I heard a clear answer to, to whether you think a, a, a formula towards trying to estimate the cost of development, research and development, 
coming forward into the process. Is that, I'm hearing from patients and others that they do view that as part of the context. That it's, and you know, David's not alone. It's a big discussion around transparency, around research and development costs. Do you view that as a rational or reasonable part of I the context that people should be thinking I about think when they're looking at I think the degree of innovativeness um, can be considered a contextual consideration. So the costs of research and development? Um, yes, I mean, as I, again, it, you have to be very careful at how you define that mm -hmm. um, and over the many years. Agreed, agreed. Okay. I'm going to open it up to the, uh, to you guys have been waiting patiently. And there's a microphone at each table, so we'll start here. Again, we're going to, we have lots to cover today. We're trying to tr frame the ethical and contextual issues with the specific question of what, if anything, is different about rarity that would lead us to want to treat it in terms of the assessment in some different way. So I'm Anna Kennedy with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. And I just want to follow up on the question that you had just asked to Diane and maybe pressure or test that question just a little bit. So there is um, legislation in, or provision within 21st Century Cures called the Advancing Targeted Therapies provision, which allows for essentially platform therapies. And there's guidance being written at the FDA for that. So in the case, so it allows for extrapolation. So in the case for, of Duchenne, for example, mm -hmm. if there is a targeted therapy for exon 51 amenable or exon 53 amenable, you don't have to start over at square one in development when you go to the rare exon. So it incentivizes development for the uber ultra rare mutations in rare disease. So just a question around how that would play out when you're talking about pricing considerations that, and I, I don't work in industry, but I would think then the subsequent trials and development using that platform technology would cost less money and wouldn't factor in the decades of development of that platform. And so then how would that play out? How would that play out? So would, they, would the company then be able to take into consideration what went into that platform that then the rare Exxon built upon. So just something to toss into consideration because that's something hopefully we're going to see companies do as we get into these much rarer subsets of the population that would never ever have a therapy developed for them if these future incentives are utilized. So just a, something to question. Yeah. I know that today in this setting we're not going to be able to figure out how to price, not how to price, how to cost out research and development. Because you said it's very complicated. There are lots of different permutations to how this happens. So I, I think we're not, we're not going to try to work out the details. And anyway, just, just try to get ideas on the table responding to this general it's instinct a, about so On a about similar costs. vein. So company A. Sorry, introduce yourself, please. Uh, Hamid, Sanofi Genzyme. Uh, so company A has very efficient uh, manufacturing processes mm -hmm. and very efficient R&D mm -hmm. processes with lower cost of development and manufacturing company B have inefficient processes with higher development. Company A provides a drug that is true breakthrough, and company B with a so-so breakthrough. Will they become even if the higher cost offset the lower cost here? So back to the platform. Right. With platforms, you're more efficient. Right. In, uh, so we don't, the, right. So whatever, whatever process, and I know this is part of the background discussion around R&D costs, we don't want to send a signal to industry that the more expensive you can make your development, um, the, the better you'll do in pricing or something like that, because that's, that's not the way we want it to work for Lockheed Martin and Boeing, and it's not the way we want it to work for, for anything that uh, the taxpayer is paying for, at least. Yes, please. Yeah, hello. <clears throat> hello. Uh, my name is Donald Hahn at Pfizer. And um, I guess just to add to the discussion around demystifying the, the price of pharmaceuticals from orphan drugs, because many, I can appreciate the, the public consumers looking at the price of the medicine and saying, why is it $1,000? You know, help me understand the cost plus formula to get to that number. And what is often difficult to communicate, and I think hopefully this is a forum where we can demystify this, is for every one drug that comes to market, as you, we all know here in the room, there's 33 others that failed in development at some form or another. And also, if you take an average, um, take a snapshot, and what is the average revenue that these orphan drugs are generating? And I would argue to say that it's about two to three, probably 250, 300 million dollars. And is that a fair return on investment when you look at the non orphan space of returns around 500, 600 million on average? 
And so these incentives are leveling the playing field and also not only f and allows companies to kind of continue to invest the dollars into innovation in rare disease versus other non-rare uh, uh, rare, uh, diseases, you know, to, to be able to level that, that investment le playing field. Um, yeah. So just some things to consider uh, right. to add to the discussion. Thanks, and I know you're, you're jumping to what I might call dessert of the day, and I'm trying to keep us in the vegetables and the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the kale and that kind of thing. So, so we will get to uh, the, the concluding session will be on the pricing and affordability conundrum. Um, and all of these issues, I'm sure, will circle back. So at, at this point, again, uh, when, it, when it gets your thoughts further on a broader view of what the ethics of this situation suggest we should do with assessing value about rarity. And this will, I would love to hear further thoughts on whether this really does help us think further or forces us to think more about what do we mean by rarity and is this where we need to say, for 190,000 patients, is that something that we should really kind of, from a contextual or ethical consideration, is that different uh, enough for us to do a different job of value assessment as opposed to 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, and again, these other criteria around how much of a breakthrough it is, et cetera, et cetera. But I know we had Alan and then the gentleman in the back. Mine is a question really for Dr. Sabin and anybody else, but, um, and thank you for the very thoughtful discourse on both Aristotle and Freud at the same time. Uh, having grown up with a mother who was a uh, Freudian psychiatrist and a son who uh, finished his uh, bachelor's degree with a uh, philosophy major, yeah, it was like having both of them at the same time in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the context of that, um, I, to the contextual considerations and rare diseases, is there also any way you put in contextually uh, the age uh, of the condition? So how do we structure it for a year of uh, living without pain for a five-year-old versus a 75-year-old or an extra year of life, not in perpetuity, but one extra year of life for a five-year-old versus a 70-year-old. Have you, are there frameworks, have you considered the frameworks of how that connects to this issue? Well, we could bring your son uh, in here uh, to help us. Uh, within philosophy, there's a whole movement called uh, ordinary philosophy, essentially common sense that borders between uh, conceptual thinking and social anthropology. And if we look at a wide range of societies, there's an ordinary morality that tends to be shared uh, at all different levels. It's not absolute. And so uh, what, what, that, the, what that guidance gives us is we, we place more value we human beings on opportunities for a five-year-old or for a 15-year-old than for a 75-year-old. Uh, being in the older category, I feel more common saying that because it's, it's about us rather than them. Uh, so, I, so I think that, that's the basic guidance. Now, can that be proven mathematically to be true? No. Uh, but as John said, uh, it, it, makes, it makes common sense. And if we, if we survey 75-year-olds, uh, actually, in my own practice, patients of mine who were not saying this out of a depression said, Doc, I, I've lived a full life. Pay more attention to the younger people. So ask your son if that, if that holds for him. And so in the context, just to follow up, it yeah. would sound like for pediatric rare diseases, there might be a different context than for the diseases, the rare diseases that affect people as they get older. Uh, in terms of this discussion, just to bring it back right. to why I asked the question. Well, one, I mean, this issue has come up. For those who use cost effectiveness, this is also an age-old question of how do we value a year of life at one end or the other of the spectrum. Um, and in England, where they've probably done, well, 
among other European countries where they've tried to engage the public in this kind of discussion. They actually decided that given the way that cost effectiveness captures a year after a year after a year of, of improved life and of longer life, that the methods actually capture that for the younger treatments adequately. And they did not want to give additional uh, weighting, if you would, to treatments for a year um, at a younger age versus an older age. And that was, I think, a general sense, again, a, a, amongst a, a group called the Citizens Council in England, that, that to do otherwise would be to discriminate against the elderly um, in some tangible way. But, it, it, but instinctually, and this is part of, of where ethics and, and social anthropology intersect, we also, I mean, one of the papers that I've written in the past talked about some orphan treatments or some genetic treatments are disfiguring. And there's something very gripping when we see someone who's ill, who looks ill, who has a swollen abdomen, who has a, you know, something wrong, especially with their face. It grabs us as human beings, as parents, as, as, as human beings. And you have to ask yourself a hard question. Do we give, is that the right way to give extra kind of uh, resources or to give extra weight based on our instinctual kind of reaction to the way a person looks when they're ill? So there are lots of different gradations, but when we see a young child ill, it is part of our makeup, at least in our society, to feel like we want extra resources for that child. And I guess ultimately the question is, do the methods of looking at value capture that instinct, or do we have to do something extra? Liz? So, Steve, I think you have to put a dollar in the societal bucket, um, because you just brought up, really, societal values. I didn't. You didn't. Well, you did, because <laughs> you, you, were, you were saying that it's, if there's a disfiguration, that there's mm -hmm. something that evokes a reaction. And mm -hmm. those reactions, and the, the example from NICE, is a different reaction based on the societal values mm -hmm. in the UK than it could be in another society. And I, I just want to, so I, I want to put that aside for a minute, but I think one thing that we, we started with with this panel was looking at the fairness, right? You had right. A, a slide up there, right. was, if, what is considered fair? That is also determined at a societal level. And, and I think the other thing that's underlying a lot of the tension in this discussion is that we also, we touched on innovation. And innovation is also a value and it is determined differently um, in different societies. What value do we put on innovation? And in this country, we put a huge tag on it. We really do. The business model enters our healthcare system, and it doesn't in other countries with one-payer systems. Right? So there's an innovation and agenda here, too, that is a, a perspective that has a societal value attached to it. And I think we're, we're we have to have that dialogue as well. It's not just about what's fair for the treatment, but it's also that we, as a society, have determined that the innovation and the business underpinnings of the innovation are also necessary. Well, I, could, we I could go back and do my, can I do this again here? Yes. It, it is part of the, of the natural tension. I, I would be careful to say that either one is, obviously they don't operate in isolation. So we could do plebiscites right now on whether uh, the money going back to pharmaceutical companies is adequate to satisfy this drive for innovation. And maybe if we had a plebiscite today, people would be voting more towards less money going towards that innovation. So I don't want to do it through plebiscite. It is part of what we have to sort out. But in the context through which you talk about reflecting social values, payers I know often feel like they are somehow delegated this job with very little uh, pr uh, kind of appreciation in some cases to make decisions about how to steward resources. Um, and society doesn't kind of get in the room and say, here's how we think you should be doing this. So we here today are kind of part of that discussion. So I will put a dollar in the jar. We're part of that discussion, though, about how at least at the value assessment, how can we at least frame some of the ethical contexts and we'll come back to who should do that. Should that be part of what we try to put in, in a report? Should it be part of what the independent council discusses in a public meeting? Should it be left over to the payer at the end of the day? How do we kind of place that? So I want to make sure that, oh shoot, let, why don't we go ahead and take a 15 minute break so that folks can visit the restrooms and check your emails. 
Um, we'll start back at 11.05, but I want to thank our panelists today. They'll be part of the rest of the day, but thank you.